hi, this is Vashti Whitfield, the Bear Old Coach from Maybe McQueen. This is the first of the Share Portfolio interviews and it's an interview with me. I thought I would uh, christen this component of the blog and share with you as openly as I can a little bit of my story. I guess the context for what I want to talk about today in our first Share Portfolio conversation is about what it took to get to where I am now and the different layers of grief. Um, grief is an extraordinary thing and had I not known or had an awareness of the different stages that I was going to travel through, there very much could have been points where I could have got lost in it, almost drowned in it. Um, because sometimes that wave becomes so big that you, you don't think you're ever going to come up for air. But as I just mentioned, having these two little cubs who were going through their own journey of ups and downs gave me tremendous context for needing to come up for air and not only come up for air, learning to swim in big white waters that, that have been very much the last year. One of the first things I, I learned about grief was that when you come into something that is so new and, it, and so unpredictable, the most important thing is to kind of stay in a safe environment. And what I realised is that my close community and where I live and the people in it, from the cafe owner to the neighbour to literally the baker, um, and the butcher and all those people that you see on a day-to-day -day basis or the person you might run past on a jog around the, the park, they became incremental and in critical in enabling me to kind of get through my days, if you like. Because the more you kind of go out into the world as this new person without this significant other in your life, the more you need to learn and adjust to being that. And so staying in within, within my community was a very safe place for me to kind of tread those first steps. I remember going into my favourite cafe, Elementary, which you've seen me Instagram thousands of times and reference many times on my blog. I would go in there and they had a separate back room, a sort of kitchen area, and they would usher myself and Indy and Jessie into there and bring us our breakfast and kind of give us that space all by ourselves. So we had the opportunity to walk down the street you know, as these new people, and walk into the cafe with other people around, but, but then just have the silence and the space to be able to deal with that, because it, it was that intense. And I felt so safe and so protected in that environment. And little by little, you learn to kind of stretch those boundaries and those comfort zones, walking the streets that you want, walk, once walked with this person or with your father, as for Jesse and Indy, and then you suddenly walk alone. And so, as you stretch those boundaries, you know, where you go for a run on the beach, where you know you're going to meet 50 different people, some of which know about Andy's passing and some of which don't, and have those uncomfortable conversations of like, how's Andy? Is he in America? And having to explain to them, and not only explain to them that he was gone, but actually pick them off the floor in their shock and kind of support them. So as you gradually build up the strength and ability to be able to do those, you start to progress your way through those different aspects of your grief. Another aspect of grief for me was about having the capacity to facilitate others. You know, for many people I know that have had to go straight back to work after losing someone, it's almost given them a context or a structure or something they could concentrate on that allowed them to not focus on the loss of the person that they love. For me, it was very different because of the nature of my work where I have to be so present and give so much on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I found it absolutely and completely something I couldn't manage and facilitate. There was a, 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 in my sadness, there was anger. So I would hear someone talking about their life and something they were challenged in, and I would think, how can you be so self-focused? You know, just get on with it. It's like, it's no big deal. You know, get off your ass and make it happen. So my patience and my ability to step into their shoes and where they, look at where they were at was absent for a fair while. But then slowly, that anger subsides and you start to be able to see what is sadness and what is anger and find a place for it. And I started to be able to kind of, you know, uh, grow again from facilitating others and grow again from hearing other people's story and not being stuck in my own. And then something happens. You kind of feel like you've reached this place where you are actually okay. You know, you're gonna be okay. The kids are thriving at school. You feel like you're human again. You're sleeping again. You're eating properly again. You're working again. And you think, you know what? I am okay. And not only am I okay, I'm really good. I'm gonna do something extraordinary 
with this little life I have because I have it and I'm so lucky to have it. And then you plan a trip on an aeroplane to go overseas and see all of your family and all of your old friends and connect with all the people that you haven't seen, not only through Andy's illness, but also in his departure. And somehow I thought this would be a really good idea to do. I had it in my head that it was a, an important part of mine and the kids healing was to be able to actually, you know, step out there, go back into the big world and the world that Andy and I very much created, go to America, go to the UK, do all of those things we did together. And if you like, retrace the steps of the journey that Andy and I walked together over our 13 years. This wasn't quite such a good idea I want to share with you. And I guess it was like 50 steps forward and a thousand steps back. When I actually landed in the UK and I landed in the States, it was almost like a, a bad joke. I think somewhere in me and through those deep, deep, impenetrable layers of grief, I'd actually thought that Andy wasn't really gone. And when I landed in the UK and I got to his family's home, I think I expected him to pop out and go, woohoo, here I am. And to my absolute surprise and, and broken heartedness, he wasn't there. And I went straight back to where I started six months prior to that trip, which was being rawer and more broken than I could ever possibly imagine. And it was, I guess, that second tier of grief, that second wave that knocks you down and says, this person is never, ever coming back. And I struggled my way through that trip, having some beautiful moments with the kids. But in all truth, I literally felt like I, I was being strangled by you know, the inability to be able to breathe, to, to, to breathe in air, to actually deal with my situation. And it wasn't until I returned home, back into that safe little bosom, that little community, where I realised just how grief-stricken I still was. And that had been six months on after Andy's passing. So I came back and I nestled down and I actually got very, very ill and I believe went through a whole new stage of grief. So without getting a very long-winded I guess what I want to share with you is that it has taken until now, and people keep saying it's very quick, it's taken till now and creating a focus and doing something that kind of honours who I am and honours who Andy is to come out of this whitewash of, of grief, for want of a better word. But the thing that has supported me and inspired me to move through this is you and your contribution to mine and my children's lives and of course Andy, because Andy's death enabled me to see there is absolutely nothing to be frightened of, because what is the worst that can happen? Because it's kind of happened, right? I mean, there are worse things that can happen that I don't want to go into without stating the obvious, but for me, having this happen allowed me to go, okay, roll up your sleeves, get off your ass, and do what inspires you most, which is making a difference, creatively sharing myself, and doing things that inspire other people to live the life they want. And so, much as I would much prefer the gorgeous Andy to, to be here, sitting next to me, talking to you, I am in somehow, some way, I am some way, somehow, grateful for this experience because it's allowed me to step into who I know I can really be. And that, in part, will help facilitate something in enabling you to be who you really want to be. And for that, we have Andy to be grateful to. And that's really all I want to say at, um, I guess, the first Share Portfolio interview. And to just say, again, thank you for letting me be here today and for taking the time to be a part of this great little journey and part of the Maybe McQueen community.